welcome and welcome to Igor Andrushenko. I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, who is joining us tonight from Stockholm in Sweden. And he brings a very, very interesting topic, uh, which won Codegeist last year. And that's a machine learning and automation app for Jira called Scrum Meister. And that's a very interesting topic. You, many of you may have read the blog post by Atlassian that the future of work and the future of collaboration apps is smart apps. And here today we have an example how to make Jira smarter in a way. And with that, Igor is not happy, but hopefully you. <laughs> and with that, Igor, over to you. And I will just disappear and see you on the other side. Awesome. Thanks for a great introduction. And uh, I hope it will make Jira smarter, but you know, time will show. And I hope my screen is uh, showing the presentation. Um, yes, that's okay. Excellent. And yes, uh, I'm, I'm super glad to be here and uh, talk about Scrum Meister and my experience of developing this uh, application with the uh, newest, uh, coolest Forge platform that is currently in works at Atlassian to replace or rather augment uh, the existing application platform. And uh, I've got a few messages in the chat about the profile of today's audience. So I will try to stay like in between of Jira administration and development, which was this presentation is already like that. So again, in the middle, there will be a demo and then questions always open to questions. So, but we can, we can keep them to the end or if you really, really want to ask something, just drop, drop, drop me a question. So all good. Right, and then yeah, let's let's start. Uh, quick intro. Uh, who am I? Um, well, I've been coding for a long time. Generally, um, I've been user of Jira because you know my work with development uh, for also for quite a long time for the last nine years or maybe even more. And I work in very different roles uh, throughout my career, uh, which uh, exposed me to. All the areas or most of the areas of software development in uh, from from field roles from qa roles to uh, engineering management roles but i ended up uh, following one of my passions uh, which is security the application security and today i work uh, in the security role uh, but also with some coding some architecting so quite uh, quite quite a technical role but also quite uh, I, I see a lot of uh, development being done around me and I see both efficiencies of that and inefficiencies. And to add to that crazy mix, I have machine learning masters. So AI, machine learning, statistical background a little bit, but I also have MBA uh, on the topic of how to build efficient development teams. So it's a bit of, uh, it may seem a bit of, you know, uh, disorganized or very, 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 very different backgrounds, but you will see how that blends together in the app that I'm creating right now and that uh, we will be talking about. But first about the problem. So about a year ago, um, I've been, uh, I was working as the engineering director for a software product company, and we faced a lot of, and throughout my career, we faced a lot of Scrum uh, iterations. We did a lot of agile development. I've seen Scrum in different variations within um, healthcare companies, within startups, within uh, scale-ups. So it was always different and it was always great, but there was also that but. So there was also always something that required a bit more effort where we felt like we are falling short of something that could have been much better. Uh, and I came to realization that the devil with Scrum and with any development process is always in the details. So you can follow the big picture, but there is always the consistency that really matters. And for uh, modern development teams at the same time, uh, they move away from being the team where everybody has a very much defined responsibility. Like, okay, I'm a quality assist, ass uh, assurance guy. I'm testing things, right? Today, developers do everything. 
they, they pretty much often manage their own backlog. So uh, on the right, I put the picture of people around the fire. So this is how uh, previously with all this different roles like product owner, engineering manager, scrum master, uh, how the development process worked uh, and looked like. So the team dances around the fire, but the fire is actually managed by a few people. And those people are quite specialized. They have a lot of uh, knowledge, but at the same time in the modern development process, I see more and more um, these roles being shared between the teams. They move away from this fire and how to get that fire going and how to empower the team around them to also be able to be efficient in the, whatever development process uh, the company is following. So I realized that most of those small things, most of this fire keeping is very simple tasks. So it's like take a branch from the forest and put it into the fire, but you have to do it every hour. Otherwise the fire will go uh, down and will, will, will not be there anymore. So with little help, everyone on the team could become that fire keeper, that, that scrum master, that PO, that EM they want to be. They can share that responsibility and they can be efficient in their development process. So those little things, reminders about those little things, putting them into perspective of quite busy people who developers and development teams usually are, is the task for Scrum Meister. So the idea is again to outsource all the routine Scrum Agile development rituals, checks, procedures, um, and give it to AI and automation. So the, the automation that keeps track of everything that doesn't forget things, that doesn't, you know, doesn't need to arrange meetings, that can integrate directly into where the work is done to Jira, right? So that's the idea and integrate at all stages. So we take just simple snapshot of development process where it starts with some ideation and it ends up with releases, with software being used, with the feedback loop from the customer. So if we can integrate into all of those places, uh, if we can uh, facilitate those checks, if we can provide those, that advice about how to develop efficiently, maybe the process, this fire will just go you know, to, to much um, larger extent, it will be much more efficient. So, and then developers can spend time on what matters. They can dance around this fire as long as, you know, and the fire will go on. So that's the idea, this picture in the, on the right hand side. And uh, again, the history of Scrum Meister was that this idea came to my, you know, to me at one point of looking at the development. And then at the si same time, I spotted this advertisement about Forge, the new platform from Atlassian, how to build uh, more easily the applications. And I had experience with trying to build something with Connect, Atlassian Connect, the previous framework. And that, that was like very hard to start with. And I ended up spending a couple of hours just to get something rendered. And I was very, very frustrated afterwards. So, and my idea was that, okay, we have Jira where all the work is done around, you know, development teams. So all the work, that's, that's the heart of it, of any development process or of most of it. And then if we put those, start putting, start, start from really simple things and then go, to, to larger extent, go to more complex things. Um, and we implement those checks where the work is being done, uh, then we can improve productivity. And again, I started in summer 2020, within one month of nine, like sleepless nights, um, managed to finish the app. And then surprisingly that won the prize um, in the Forge app category of the Atlassian organized hackathon for Forge apps and for Atlassian apps. And that's been an amazing validation that maybe this idea has some sort of future. And since then I've been developing this project uh, on the Atlassian Forge. And to put it into perspective, the Atlassian Forge is the bringing the Atlassian development experience into the cloud. So pretty much this is the serverless platform. So I don't manage, I'm actually, I mean, I do manage few servers with APIs, but that's just for 10% of functionality. 90% is done within Atlassian by Atlassian servers with their serverless functions uh, that, that are invo invoked on, on demand. So I don't see it at all. I just write a JavaScript code and I, I push to, 
to my repo and then I deploy to the cloud. So I don't see 90% of complexity of it. And I just pretty much, I, I, I write code. And as you remember, I have a bit of a security background. And for me as a security person, it's very important that with Forge, I explicitly can make the data of the customer stay in the platform. Because if you think about it, I don't have to send any data from customers Jira anywhere outside of Atlassian ecosystem if I can just manage with, um, well, with, with the Forge serverless platform. So I, I just say, okay, execute this job for me or fetch something from the internal Jira API. So I don't have to do anything on a third party side, which is my side. And it means there is zero risk of losing that data or that that data ends up in the wrong hands. And for small developers uh, that have, you know, some other projects, they have full-time jobs at the moment, it's perfect setup. So you can take your idea and you can quickly execute it in the very um, convenient language which JavaScript is with great ecosystem, which NPM and the whole Node.js libraries ecosystem is. And just simply, you don't have to manage servers. So just push it there and see it working. And don't even care about security because it's built in. So that's been quite, I mean, the idea of Forge is brilliant. And later on, I'll show you the slide with some experience about what I learned about Forge, where it, you know, some things you have to be aware of, but at the same time, it's proven to be quite a big part of this app's development and success. And the whole reason it exists is because Forge was quite straightforward to start with and quite easy to progress. Right, now a few words about the features of the app. It's uh, again, as I mentioned, I just put the scrum process in the middle, but also it works with Kanban where the tasks, you know, we don't have sprints, the tasks just have, uh, they arrive in the backlog and then you move them to, to do, to progress and then you finish them. Um, but the idea is to integrate into all the stages of the process, starting from product backlog uh, quality checks. So product backlog consists of issues. So we check, we have, I have implemented 12 checks that checks how uh, good is this issue. If there is anything missing, because you won't believe how many times in my experience, I've seen some work being forgotten in the backlog, just literally customer security bug has not been fixed because it was just on the bottom of the backlog and was never properly groomed. So things like that, those issues would be spotted, right? And then if you write your user story better, if you use fields that Jira provides and your team agreed to use, that those, those all are simple things. But again, this app brings, first of all, consistency. And that's, that's the goal. Then we move on. Then let's say there is a daily scrum. So daily scrum, it's the sprint progression. So sprint is going on, then there is some, uh, well, some, something's happening, something's going not according to the plan, some issues are being moved to progress and back, and all those things can indicate on certain problems during the sprint. So during your daily scrum, you're supposed to uncover those problems and solve them before they become an issue. But again, like if, if there is an automation that can help you where you can open during your daily scrum a page that says, hey, these are the issues you need to take, take a look at because of A, B, C, D. So, also identified 10 areas in which we can find issues with scope creep, where let's say if a product owner continues to modify the issue description at the, on the second week of the, of the sprint, maybe there is a bit of a scope creep going on for that issue, for that story. And inconsistent work patterns, lack of ownership, if the issue is assigned to 10 members of the team one by one, there is again, something, something is not quite right. And then having all that information, what we can do, we can incorporate that into the retrospective. So in the retrospective, we look at how it worked out for the previous sprint. And then all this information is like a timeline or a post-mortem, well, if everything goes really bad. Uh, and then it's perfect for, because I also realized that in the retros, you, uh, quite often we forget about certain problems or we don't remember them anymore because you know, they were in the beginning of the sprint. And when the team comes together and they start discussing, not always the, the, the older issues are brought up or some, you know, some bigger issues take the stage, but we, we still need that kind of consistency. We need to remember all, all the things that went not quite right and recommend how to fix them. 
So this is what also app uh, brings in. And finally, there is an experimental feature where you can see the backlog state. So something that is not in the sprint, something that is not groomed, but rather, you know, if uh, the number of open bugs goes up consistently, that's not a good sign. So signs like that, it helps you spot them. So um, now before, before I go to the demo, I think demo is one of the next uh, options on the list. Um, this app heavily uh, relies on AI and machine learning. And you ask where it is and how is it implemented? So a bit of background. First, I implemented AI. I started with dedicated servers. I started with my own laptop, where is uh, GPUs, where some TensorFlow models were running. So the idea was to generate the text to help users write better stories, right? So that was part of the backlog uh, grooming part of the story creation. And again, that worked well, but it was not really scalable, right? And it was quite a limited functionality of the AI. Um, but luckily, uh, the, if you know, if you know OpenAI, the company OpenAI, if you know GPT-3, if that rings the bell, that's one of the most famous AIs up to the date. Uh, and that's the one that uh, creates amazing images. That's the one that generates rap songs. And there is much more application of that. Um, so that's, that's the coolest model out there. And apparently they provide access to their API via the company called OpenAI um, for, well, for a small price, but that price is comparable to sometimes running your own server in the cloud. And that thing is very powerful. And this is very, uh, well, it's, it's the, literally, it's the AI. So it's not something that disguises itself. You know, you put the linear model out there and you say you have AI. So this thing, I, I realized that it's better, it's more efficient to use a, a integration with a famous third party, AI with the most cutting edge technology rather than um, just, just trying to build something myself. However, this is done for advanced features and I will show you uh, them to you. Uh, but my idea was that, you know, when we don't need AI, even though the app, well, capitalizes on that a bit, Simple checks are still efficient and simple things are the things that are least likely to break. So in my case, I implemented lots of simple things, a few more, more complex things with machine learning that was done on the browser side uh, because there are a bunch of amazing browser uh, machine learning uh, libraries that you can use in Forge. So you can just import them like a third party component and you can use it and use the customers, the client's browser for calculations. Of course, it, there, there must be nothing too, too extensive. It's not like you can run, uh, well, GPUs or you can run some uh, very, very complex models. Well, you actually can, but that wouldn't be efficient. So the idea is that to use machine learning where you need it and use AI for the most cool and advanced things. And I will show you them in the moment. Um, but again, this is, this is the idea behind the, the AI integration for the project. So um, how, how and where, I mean, first of all, how the Forge app looks like. So this is, this is the example of the Forge app. And I will, I will spend a bit of time showing what is done with which component just to show the difference. So for example, um, with Forge, there are certain limitations of what you can do. For example, currently there is no administration menu or, or certain pages you can't integrate to, into everything. Uh, so if you feel like some UI could have been done better, in some cases it's just because it's, it's how it is, it's what it allows for. But then starting with, uh, with that picture of development lifecycle, here we have what, uh, what we can do on the side of issue grooming. So let's say you have a story and this story consists of, you know, pretty some bad descriptions, some, you know, it's incomplete. Let's say you don't have anything else associated. So the idea is that, that you, first of all, you can run uh, the checkout, the very simple checkup here on this side. And I, I, I loaded this page before, so don't think it's, uh, it's instant, it's not. 
So what happens when I open this, and this is integrated into issue glance, it's using issue glance module. So what happens now there is a serverless function running somewhere on Atlassian servers and it's executing the backend computation. So it's calculating how good is the score according to the set of checks. I'll show you the checks later. So, and then it calculates, it says, okay, you got 78 points, right? And then it says what to improve. So that's, that's one part of the application. So it goes through a certain set of checks. And then for example, it sees, okay, there is no task. There is no subtask for the story. Apparently it's, it's empty. Then it would add it here. For example, if I add here, if I do the empty description here, just, just remove everything then update the score. So it will go down. It will go down and it will be much worse. So it says, okay, this is a story. You need, according to Scrum, you need to add a persona to the story description. For example, you should say, as somebody, I would like to do this so that I achieve this outcome. So this is standard, uh, standard Scrum routine, standard Scrum template. So it recommends you using it, right? Again, in the administration window, I'll show you later, you will be able to disable it. So you will be able to configure it. But again, like this screen here, it just shows you what, uh, what you can do about this issue to make it better so that your teammates can uh, also you know, follow the same standard and you can be on the same page regarding the consistency of your development process. So once you complete the things. Once you follow this, you can update and you get better score. And the score is saved elsewhere. Um, the score is saved in the, uh, with Forge, you get this uh, backend storage. There is a storage module and you save any information you want there. And here is another module that shows how the score of this project, how the score of this issue score, and now I have to update it because it's uh, so that it updates this calculation, I hope, um, uh, how it compares to other scores to the, in the project, right? So you can see here this issue score, and there are certain domains of uh, quality of this issue. And here is a bit of uh, explanation on what means what. But the idea is that, again, as I said, we want consistency. We want something to... Uh, well, we want all the teams work together in a similar way and that the team understand the project, whoever works within the project follows the same rules. So here it shows, you know, this issue, for example, it has lower score than the average issue in the project. And this is the Scrum Meister score, uh, the one that is calculated on this right side. So it means you can improve certain areas of it and you can be, you can say, hey guys, we need to follow Scrum better and then your team could, could concentrate on improving your follow Scrum score and so forth. So it provides a bit of a breakdown into this score on the right. Now, as you can see, um, this page is, uh, well, you can see the page on the right and you can see this nice page with the graphics. So this is, uh, this is using the different features of Forge. And on the right, we have the Forge UI kit it's uh, where Forge provides you with the basic UI components. You put them together, you do the calculations in the background, that's it. This one is custom UI. Here you can bring any library you want. So you could bring machine learning. And here is example of the machine learning. So this thing uh, is called sentiment analysis. So pretty much it analyzes how negative is the discussion. So if, if there is some toxicity going on, there apparently it would be red and it would be minus score in this case. And this is done in browser. Well, no, actually, I'm sorry. This, not, this is not done in the browser, but it, in one of the previous creation it was. So it's done actually on the backend side, but still in the custom UI, which means I can bring any library here um, and I could make Forge serverless platform, use it and work it for you know, calculating something. And in this case, it's discussion score. And if you look down here, somebody commented like really horrendous things down here. So, and apparently it recognized it. So now if you wonder like, what's the use, what on earth can you use the sentiment analysis score uh, in JIRA, right? So here a bit of an explanation that it is used in the um, uh, sprint analytics. So this is our next module. So sprint analytics, uh, one where 
teams can follow these teams can follow daily on a daily basis, for example, um, and they can identify any issues that require attention. So it's it's pretty simple. It just gives you a list of issues, and it says, "Hey, look, this is a lot of scope creep detected. So we realize this issue changes description too too often, and risk is high. Which means it's if, if you have, I mean, there are different levels of how much, how many times you need to change description for this." to be high or medium or low. And then other things like stale issues, issues that everybody forgot about. They, you created them or they stuck in the to-do column or in the some other testing column forever. So these are those issues. And finally, we see at the bottom, we see our issue with the negative sentiments, which is, I think it's quite interesting because in my experience, I've seen sometimes you know discussions under issues that were clearly negative. So if the team uh, or a person in the team who is responsible for uh, efficiency of work, like Scrum Master, uh, Scrum Master somebody who, um, who, who facilitates the development process sees this, they would be like, oh, let's, let's fix the problem. There is apparently a problem. Who is this Igor Andre who's posted toxic comments? We need to talk to them, right? And say, you know, maybe, maybe tune it down a bit or what's, what's the root cause of the problem. So that's, that's the sprint analytics. And again, when the sprint is closed, that data is saved. Um, well, and it's saved on the go as well. And then it ended up in issues uh, retrospective. So at the end of uh, the day, when the sprint is done, you do in the uh, retrospective. So again, Scrum Meister was not wasting time because it has unlimited power, power abilities of Forge platform. Uh, so it detects all the problems. So for example, it says, hey, this sprint didn't have a goal. Check, problem. Um, significant delay in finishing the last sprint compared to planned date. So sprint was over overshot. So instead of finishing it uh, you know, on the day when, when you're supposed to, when you dedicate uh, the finish date, it, it missed it, okay? And so forth. And there are more than 30 checks like that. So. It checks various things. Some of them come from the issues description here. Some of them come from uh, sprint analytics uh, and uh, risk levels. And some of them are quite, uh, quite unique. So again, this can be used and it generates different inputs for every retrospective based on how, wh what went wrong, right? And how to, any, any suggests how to improve. And this part, these two parts, actually, you see, oh, actually all these parts are done with the, uh, Forge UI kit. It's not the custom UI. It's the more conservative way of, but quicker way of uh, developing. And now the one of the final pages here is the administration. And this is where I believe it's quite getting quite interesting because uh, the idea is to allow to modify because I know that development processes, they're quite different between each other. And somebody doesn't require subtasks. Somebody doesn't require issues to be connected to epics and so forth for somebody uh, you need to have a certain amount of words in the description so it can be considered uh, at least, you know, good start. So all these things, they can be configured, saved in the, the storage that I mentioned. And then whenever the, 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 this data is calculated, it fetches the settings from the store uh, and, uh, well, calculates uh, the difference and calculates whether it's a problem or not. Now, activating AI. So now the fun part. So AI, the one from the open AI, of course, it's a, a bit of a, well, there is a bit of a financial impact. So it's not activated immediately, but it brings some value. And once you do it, it's, it changes a few things. So now GPT-3, that famous whatever AI, which I may have oversold already, will start helping you to write this issue description. So it will look at the uh, at the summary on top, and it will try to come up with the good Scrum-like uh, issue description to start with. So it should show up down here. Yes. Uh, look at this. So it's just, this thing was literally created by the AI just in the real time. So it looked at this description and if you can see it here, I'm not sure uh, if you can. Boop. 
that's wrong. That's better. So here it, it says, as a designer, I need to be able to use the latest framework feature so that I can create better UI. Well, whether it's a good fit for this issue or not, that's, uh, well, that's, that's up for the discussion, but then you can regenerate it. And if you, it usually helps for, you know, semi-complete issues uh, for, well, it, it helps you to start with the Scrum-like way of writing them. And also, I mean, bonus, it's, it's written by really AI. How often do you do that? Uh, let's try again. I think it should have, as a developer, I would like to have the latest framework features so that I can improve the UI. Well, that's better, I think. It's still guessing who, who are you and what's your profile, but also the more you add here, or if you change this description to something else, I mean, it is, it is, it, it is working a bit differently. So, but this is, this is live thing. This is really AI right there. And then another place where, where it, uh, chips in is also, you know, Scrum sometimes, how many times have you wondered, am I doing something right about Scrum or is it, is it agile what I'm doing or what's the best way to calculate the issue estimates? So here we have, um, well, it's a chat with uh, GPT-3. So here in the real time, you can ask the model any of your questions. So what let's let's do the let's do the uh, something unexpected. You can type a question you want to ask uh, into the into the questions, and I will ask it in here in the chat. So if you have any Scrum related question, Agile related question, let's let's try it out. In the meanwhile, I can ask, what is Scrum? I ask a question. Yay, and that's uh, that's that's the AI. It's using its own knowledge base. I, I don't know. It's, it crawled all the Wikipedia's of the world and it figured out answers to all questions. So, or then we can ask how to estimate issues. This is hard. It may not work out. How to estimate issues? You measure the size of task in hours or points and multiply it with your team efficiency. And boom, there. Any questions about Scrum to ask the GPT-3 model? I mean, I understand. I mean, it may be not the first thing you want to have in your Jira, but at least it's, uh, well, it's AI and it's quite, uh, you know, sometimes I, I wonder about something. So this is, uh, this may provide a quick answer sometimes. Uh, regarding the, I see the question in the meanwhile about the configuration uh, values, as I understand here in the administration menu, uh, they are project based. And then here you can activate the Scrum Master for this project or deactivate it. So it doesn't bother, it doesn't bother you at all. So of course, if you have multiple projects, you would need to do some consistent, if you want to consistently maintain the same way of working, you would have to make sure they use the same settings, but at the same time, some projects would not be, I know that some teams will not be quite happy with uh, following everything up to the latter. So there could be a bit of a difference, but again, it's up to the application. So you can, you can in your application, you can create it. It's just, it's using the same storage and storage is uh, shared for, for the instance. So your app, no matter what project it's working in, uh, will be able in this instance of uh, Jira, like here, I have it. Uh, will will be able to access it if you if you open it with with in the code, for example. Right. So that's that was that was my question, my answer. All right, and then um, I I also talked about uh, showing some sort of backlog control or backlog summary. And it shows it here in the issue view and it's not optimal. I would prefer it to be at least here on the project level. Uh, but I mean, this is custom UI. So I brought in recharge GS library here and uh, implemented these charts. So this is using the 
uh, well, I mean, this is this is the, the place where the only place it could go at the moment. But of course, I hope that Atlassian will develop something and will uh, add it on this level or on some other level where we can have some sort of backlog control room. So things that you look at the things that are not in motion, the things that are maybe forgotten. So for example, the, the open tasks and stories count in your backlog. So is it growing with numbers of bugs and so forth? So I know you can set up Jira dashboards for that, but also if the Scrum Master says, the App Scrum Master says, it helps you control and bring that consistency to your development process, I figured out it could be quite, uh, quite a good place to already have this simple chart where you can see the trend uh, of, of things, let's say empty issues. Yes, I created 252 empty issues at some point just for testing. So you can see that here had something happened. I needed more. So, and things like that. Okay, uh, well, I have a question in the chat. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, project with multiple teams, uh, that would be a good real world question for, uh, for, for this app, how to implement that. But I, I think if, if there is one project, then most likely teams work in the similar manner, at least on that project. At the same time, if, if we see a big need for uh, having uh, multiple teams with multiple configuration, like board-based settings, uh, we can definitely we can definitely add it to the app. But currently, it's one team in the project, or multiple teams that work in the same manner, or at least same Scrum Master manner, uh, as yeah, as that like that. Right, so implementation challenges. So Forge, one of the biggest implementation challenges that Forge limits invocation of a function. So something you can do for, for only 10 seconds. You mean, it means if some calculation takes longer, you have either to divide it into smaller functions and invocate them one by one, storing the result somewhere, like in the storage that I mentioned, or just you know, optimize your calls. So it's, uh, it's, it's a standard in serverless where you pay in general, if you have a serverless uh, function as a service running somewhere as a cloud provider, you charge for, for the time it works. So 10 seconds is the hard limit here. Uh, also, there is different UI kits that, that uh, are provided by, by Atlassian. So it's Forge UI, more conservative, it's custom UI, the newer, the more beta likes, so there are still some issues and it requires a bit more effort. You cannot develop as quickly with that, but it allows you to bring any library you want. Uh, most of the calculations, uh, they need to be done asynchronously. They need to be done somewhere in the background. So don't, don't count on something running for one hour. And then, uh, for example, I had to implement a couple of scheduled jobs that just calculate those stats for, for the charts for me, because otherwise, I had no other way to keep that data updated. Uh, and of course, uh, I figured out with Forge, it's really good. And it's uh, something that can, apps should really look into is how to keep the data in the customer platform to, so that you, it doesn't leave the platform. You, you don't have to process it on your side. You just process it within Atlassian. You process it within customer's environment, which is amazing for security. Um, yeah, and my challenge was that I only say the data to the AI if customer opts in and, well, says, yes, I want to do it. So by default, the cool features, they are disabled, but also it allows for the optimal security model where nothing leaves, literally nothing leaves the customer platform, no data. Right, future for Scrum Meister. Again, public validation, like question about teams, multiple teams, multiple boards. I've been looking into that, but this again puts more um, importance on that question and that uh, I have to come up with a solution for that. And then uh, Forge, Forge going live, there is a plan. I mean, don't take me for that. <laughs> um, but Forge is, may go live around April. We'll see about that. So we'll see the public release, uh, but sometime this year. Uh, and again, like I hope to, to put the, the, the app into the wild 
and uh, see the real customer feedback and if it can help real customers improve their development process a little bit. Um, yeah, my also another idea for me is to add fully customized checks. So where you saw, what you saw is, is a set of hard-coded checks with some customization. What I was thinking is we can extract certain data points, we can extract certain data and allow customers, users of Jira, administrators, configure their own checks. So for example, your team does not follow Scrum uh, or this sort of, uh, well, Scrum definition for the story. All right, let's follow something else. There is different frameworks, there are different rules, and we can customize those checks and make Scrum Meister become like Agile Meister or Safe Meister or whatnot. Uh, and of course, more AI use cases. So today, uh, I think most useful, honestly, use case is the sentiment generation because it can show you uh, what are the negative issues. However, at the same time, the most expensive uh, is the open AI integration. It does integrate a real AI. Does it bring value? I mean, I think it does bring some value, but there could be more. And of course, there, are, there is a lot of use cases for simpler AI or simpler machine learning or even simple linear models where you can predict whether this, this, this sprint will fail based on its progression uh, using the data from the same project. So things like that uh, done on the customer side, on the browser side, that will be more of that before the public release. And again, Forge opportunities, what few words about Forge. So Forge is really easy to start with. I had almost no JavaScript experience before, just some. And then I still managed to create the app within a month in the ecosystem that I, I knew Jira from the user perspective. I learned APIs, I learned Forge and managed to create the app. So that's that's been quite impressive for me how easy it's been on the Forge side. So I think Forge is ideal for smaller, smaller applications that work on the client side. That's just, that's just the sweetest spot there because you can start really quickly. If you needed that one check for a certain custom field you have in all of your projects and your organization, the best bet is to just get started with Forge and within the week, it's likely you will be able to implement that small thing, right? Uh, but also, if you look for more flexibility, of course, custom UI where you bring your own libraries uh, is, uh, is your choice, but it's, it requires more work and more, like, it's, it has a bit of a quirky integration with the whole Atlassian, uh, well, the Jira, underlying Jira and Confluence um, backend. So it limits a bit some of the capabilities and you have to figure out how to use it in a certain way, but it still works. And then one of the things about Forge is that you don't have to pay for using it at the moment. Um, so it's like you're running your code on their servers, you're running the real application and that's it. So how, how amazing is that? And uh, yeah, I mean, it's still in beta, so things break, there is no warning. And like today I showed you the chat for Scrum Meister AI and that chat day ago, it was like in a super weird shaped window. So it was looking like uh, it has just a very small, uh, small space for it. But then they fixed it. And then you still can influence the development of the platform. So that's, that's a good sign. You can just write on, the, on their forums and they will fix it very quickly. Right, if you are interested in checking this out, having a free beta, absolutely. I would love that. And again, I mean, I'm here to hear re real feedback. I'm here to reach out to, to the real world with this. So let's, let's chat, let's get in touch. And I would love to set it up and look into your use case and which checks you want, which checks you need and how to make it happen. So again, like this is super early, you have amazing opportunity to shape the future, the direction. And then, you know, if you had something that you realize, oh, Scrum Miser would be amazing for this use case of mine, just let me know. We will definitely make that happen. Okay, that was that was the presentation. Um, thanks a lot for your attention today. Okay, thank you very much. And while I promote everybody to the panel, there is a uh, question in the chat. Uh, the question is, can I have customized reports for my 
uh, can I get re can we get reports based on my customized definition of done? So I have a, a customized definition of done, and could the app check for that? I think that's an amazing uh, amazing uh, suggestion. And this is definitely, I will write it down. So it definitely can, because definition of done is just the field in your uh, Jira. So we can fetch the definition of done. And then for, well, we can figure out how to process that because the definitions of done can be quite custom, but it would be really interesting if, if you can come up also with the ideas of the most useful checks, let's say, if you have a problem with people not writing documentation or something like that, we can see, you know, we can parse it based on the certain keywords and then suggest adding certain checks into the um, into the checklist. Yeah, but this is this is example of the custom check that would be really interesting, I think. Okay. Yeah. So, and there was one question open in the Q and A box. Do you plan it also for server data center? So for the on-premise versions. I don't think Forge is available or they plan to do it, to make it available for, nope. uh, yeah, for the data center. So no, uh, unless they make it available, then yes, but okay. I don't think so. Uh, let me see. Yeah, because I mean, it's fully cloud based. So I, I see hard time how they could could work it out. They are thinking about some integration between cloud and, and data center, but only for Jira service management at the end of the year. And I do not know if that will include Forge in any way, shape or form. There's no, there's nothing on the roadmap either for this year. So Forge will be a cloud thing for the time being. Um, I have a question uh, and the question is, um, so let me understand this, how you use AI. This AI is part of the Forge stack that you are using. It's not an external AI or how is that working? Or did I misunderstand that? Uh, you, you understood correctly. So there are two parts. One part is where I'm using a Node.js library, uh, which computes the sentiment score based on the uh, well certain model with the existing where it crosses like use natural language processing uh, mm -hmm. framework. And then it uh, well looks at the sentence in the comment and then it assigns a score to each token and realize, okay, this is negative. This is passive aggressive and so forth. So that thing works in Forge. It works in the Forge backend. It works uh, when the function is invoked. So when you saw that uh, trigger or, or that, that uh, spinning wheel on one of the issues, that's, that's the invocation of a certain function that renders later on when it's done, it renders the, uh, the UI and some put some things into that. At the same time, uh, there is a third party integration, the, uh, the one that I enabled in the settings and then it wrote the issue or suggested that as a developer, I need a UI framework so that I can uh, create a new UI, for example, that was mm -hmm. written by the open AI, it's a okay. company uh, with GPT-3 model, the most famous AI at the moment up to date. Uh, and that, that was done through the integration. So how it does it? So I have the, my third party, that, that, well, I'm third party in this case, API. And then the Forge sends, from Forge, I sent the description, the, the description of the issue into that API and the data API sends it into open AI. And then I retrieve the output, what it suggests, and I send it back to Forge and Forge displays it. And it was done within a matter of like three seconds or so. Okay. So, but again, like that's done only if you activate it and you don't have to. Yeah. Okay. So that's basically offloading to an external feature set. Yes. Um, so any plans for uh, using other external libraries? Like, I don't know. Uh, whatever AWS is coming with in AI uh, right now, or um, you chose that one because it's open AI and because it's famous, but in principle, you could choose any library that, that any you library. wanted. Yeah. I mean, eventually at some point before that, I was running this, this same laptop I'm, I'm speaking with mm -hmm. you from, it has GPU. And on that GPU, I was running the TensorFlow model for generating text as well. And then I exposed it to the internet. And then my 
Scrum Master API was sending instead of the open AI, it was sending the issue description into this laptop. But then I figure out, you know, first of all, if you were a customer, it would be really hard for me to explain why it works on my laptop. Second of all, if I was to provision GPU server, it would cost me like hundred dollars per day. And so forth. Yeah. So there is a lot of, you know, in this model, it's, it's not really scaling and it's not really secure. And with open AI, I mean, the company has great reputation. Uh, there is lots of uh, important security features implemented. So for example, it does not uh, return any unsafe outputs. So if you ask it something strange or offensive or, or containing personal information, it will blacklist it. It will say, no, I will not reply to this because I detected that it contains some information that I don't want to process. So it's also like there is a lot of baked in security in that. Okay. But again, it's use cases, they're a bit limited. So exactly as you're saying, so third party like AWS, AI, the machine learning labs of Azure and so forth, that's just uh, like a gold mine. So, mm -hmm. but I also think a lot of potential, my idea was of a pyramid. So here is, we have this, you know, top of the pyramid, some super cool AI, like chat with the AI in, in Jira. I mean, not useful, but, but interesting. But at the bottom, we have this all checks, the things that really help to improve development process. And if there is anything on the AI side that can eventually help, it will go down to the bottom line. But of course, the value, the simpler the thing is, the, the, the more chance it will bring real value to me at least. So like, uh, for example, the definition of done, uh, customized checks or reports, that would be cool task in between of AI or at least some natural language processing and normal checks. So my idea is to like take that to the libraries called NatureGS, for example, and do it in the, on the customer or at least in the Forge backend, uh, just, just process the data and show some specific checks or show how it complies to those checks. So that could be a nice blend. And I think this is one of the next things where I'll definitely put into my backlog. Okay. So, but as far as I understand it, um, the, the exchange between Forge and an external uh, application is still call by call. There's no, no, uh, currently no mechanism to transfer bulk data for analytics or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's a post request. So it's, it's just, it's just HTTPS post, yes. Yeah, so just a simple call and I cannot create a call that, let's say, give me all the, the, the user stories from the last 24 hours or something in one JSON. Yeah, I mean, Would you can do that, you can do yeah. that. I mean, I, yeah. I use GQL, 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 Jira yeah. query language a lot yes. for mm -hmm. querying all this information within Forge, within uh, Atlassian instance. Mm -hmm. So then uh, I extract, for example, Spring Lang, I extract all the issues from the open sprint and so forth. So you can do that and then you can send that information elsewhere. But mm -hmm. yeah. Because there's, there's, uh, we have a, we have quite a few discussions planned uh, for next month around this topic, AI and machine learning and, and whatnot and all that stuff, and and also business analytics and BI, which is not exactly the same, but it's at least related. And the big issue is that that uh, you can only have single data set analysis in a way, which is of course very difficult for for time series or whatnot. And especially if you say sentiment analysis, you, you, how would you handle uh, a trend analysis? Has the sentiment gotten better or worse? So you can only tell me the sentiment right now is 24%. Hmm. But is that an improvement to the last time I checked or is it an, so how would you do something like that? Because that would be interesting. Yeah. So let's say uh, I have a very discussion that's going bad. So I'm seeing that sentiment is going down. I have to have some kind of, uh, I have to go in there and fix something. And then I fix it. And after that I see, ah, my fixing was uh, successful and the sentiment is going up again. Can, how do you do that? How do you handle such time series stuff? So that's, that's my question. If you only have a yeah. call by call uh, yeah. analysis. That's interesting. That's, yeah. uh, that's where the forge and its storage comes really handy. What I do actually, I run certain uh, certain functions, certain calls that calculate 
uh, things like sentiments, like issue scores and so forth. I run them on the schedule. So they run every hour or on demand if you open it. So in that thing, I put the time into the, I create like there is a list of observations. Each observation is a JSON object. There is a time field and there is a score for sentiment. So for example, I can see how the general sentiment score was changing uh, along the sprint and for which issues. So for example, if the issue had medium risk, medium risk, it's just the number associated in the backend in the storage uh, to the, uh, to, to, well, related to the risk uh, level, well, I mean, how bad was sentiment? So if they would be score minus 10, it would be high risk. If there'll be more issues, there would be high risk and so forth. So it creates this, this time series, it creates a story behind it, and then it can analyze, it can check latest and observations, or I do some checks where there is like 75% of sprint is done, which means it takes from, from now or from when the sprint was closed, uh, and it takes like last 25% and it looks if there's too many issues open there. Mm -hmm. so, there is a way to handle it, but you just have to be mindful of the storage and the storage limits because the storage, each storage field can uh, contain uh, 32,000 symbols, which means okay. you cannot put everything there. So mm -hmm. then I have a job that uh, squashes them because if I run it every hour, I get too many inputs. I don't need that many. So I could do it daily or weekly or depends. So then I squash them and average so that they don't take that much space. Or alternatively, you can use a couple of storage fields and just chain them together, like go from this to this to this to collect that information. Okay. Have you looked at the, at the differences in capability between the different uh, cloud license models? Because I know there's a difference in a number of executions between uh, premium and standard and upcoming enterprise. So um, have you looked at that, how that would affect an application like yours? And in fact, would affect an, an application like yours? I mean, if not, well, it's okay, but I just yeah. wanted, but there, there are differences in the number of executions and, and all that stuff that you have, uh, especially yeah. for automation uh, in the different license tiers. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've been in talks with the Forge team around the, uh, quotas and limits and I don't think it's something I can disclose because they're still okay. working mm -hmm. on them but at least I can say that uh, they're looking into like real use cases of potential applications and how many executions does it need and okay. based on the numbers I saw there was nothing alarming it was like yeah it makes sense mm -hmm. if you think about how many times you would run a certain function or on certain schedule but again as with everything with Forge, there is this 10 seconds limit, there is 32,000 characters limit on the storage mm -hmm. and so forth. So you cannot just use them as you know as you have all resources in the world. So you always need to think, okay, maybe I should put these things, you know, like do them at the same time or not wait here and do the asynchronously. So it, it, it puts its toll, but also I guess it's also good practice. It facilitates a better, more efficient use of resources. So, okay. Yeah. Cool. But they will publish them once once Forge goes GA. They will publish those those quotas. Yeah, that, that that's on the roadmap for Q1 2021. So they have another four weeks to figure that one out. So yeah. that, that's good luck. <laughs> or some some eight no eight weeks. Uh, quarter one is end of yeah. March. So we still at the beginning of February. First of February today. Oh, good. Um, one other question, and that's the the um, because. Uh, there was this question about the definition of done. Uh, have you thought about um, building uh, um, a discussion discussion point, points for retrospectives? So yeah. let's say, so sprint analysis and not only the hard factors like velocity and, and story points and burn down and whatnot, but also the soft factors. So you had a bit of a, uh, you had a bit of stressful time in the middle of that sprint and you always have a stressful time at, 10, at, at day 10 of your sprint and why is that? So uh, the last four days are always calm, but then at day 10, you have a stressful time. Yeah. So what's the, the, the root cause or something like that? So for retrospective, basically. Yeah, yeah, maybe I was too quick to show that, but there is a retrospective module that does 
partially that. So it checks like is if the screen has goals. So that's a hard check. But also mm -hmm. some things it exactly checks if how many issues were still open on the last day of sprint before okay. closing. And if it's more than a certain percentage, it raises the alarm. And the goal for me is to add also the customization to that. So from the admin menu, you would be able to customize. You can say, I want five issues or I want 20% here. And then, so you can, if you are not happy with the hard coded limits, you can always uh, set your own depending on how the team works, right? But exactly the soft thing, and then it creates the inputs. It says what it spotted and how to fix it. So it's, it's the a retrospective inputs, exactly. So you could basically also create some kind of uh, yeah, team health check or team sentiment check. Let's yeah. like, uh, are these people working smoothly or is there stress? Uh, yeah. And where does it come from? Is it is it everybody against everybody or is there somebody who's always nagging or whatever? So, Brilliant. Yeah. I'm, I'm writing down. I'm writing down. <laughs> because that's different to see from all the points and all that stuff. But yes. uh, you would see that during dailies maybe, but uh, in times like, the, like these, where we are all on TV, you do not have the, the visual feedback in a daily. Like how do people are standing around and yeah. how do they flock together? That's not like... Yeah, just track their, track their through the webcam, track their faces and recognize yeah. the emotions. It's <laughs> like your team no, is not, smiling. No, not What's that, wrong? but there's a, there's in a daily, you normally get not only the hard facts, you only get also get the soft facts. So how, how are people looking? Right. Are they fit? Are they healthy? Is the, um, are they bushy tiled and bright eyed or whatnot? So you see, are they okay? Are they fit? Are they, are they happy? Whatever. It's not just a, a screen, but in Zoom, we all have, uh, I mean, we are all on TV and on TV, you have a persona. That's not you. That's, that's, that's a face you set up for the screen. Um, so, um, and you're only a face, you're nothing else. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, sentiment analysis, I think is important in times like these yeah. to but find also, out stuff like that. Yeah, as you mentioned, if you will look at the end of the sprint, if the last sprint was very stressful, we can have a stress level on the sprint. And then we can say about, we can have a dashboard for the team health and say that could take into account the current uh, sentiments, the previous sentiments, like sort of accumulate the stress and say, hey, team is like, yay or nay, or where it is kind of on the spectrum of, of, uh, of the mood. And by the way, I, I just, I saw the question to the Scrum Master uh, yes. AI in the, in the chat. You posted it, right? Or No, there's uh, Amota posted another question. Can oh. Forge help? in creating, suggesting the effective workflow for different issue types? Um, well, maybe if someone creates the app that does that, definitely. But I don't think it's that, I mean, it's not smart out of the box. So it's what you make, make it do. So maybe, absolutely, maybe you can say this issue looks like test, then this is a good workflow and this issue looks like bug. Here is, here is the workflow, but I don't know. I have to check. We have another uh, presentation in March um, for an app called Predictions for Jira. I think that's in that direction. And that's interesting because that, that guy started with Forge and went to Connect. Really? Before he went live because he's already on the marketplace. Um, and uh, I have to ask him why he switched from Forge to Connect. But um, um, I guess... It's a better API. It it's gives you more power from, from a programming language perspective, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. But um, they have something like that, as far yeah. as I understood the application. And he won Codegeist with Forge, but now he moved to Connect to publish it on Marketplace. Yeah, maybe that's why. So yeah. he can be quicker. At yeah. I have to ask him why he did it. Uh, and if that's the only reason, or if he just was impatient and wouldn't, wouldn't want to wait for Forge, or if he has any other reasons for that. All right, I have a, I have a question here. May I ask? Yes, of course. Uh, so th this is again, uh, you know, I joined very late. Uh, I, I completely missed it that uh, from the starting time here. So I'm not. If this has been discussed, I apologize. I may I'm ask you for the recording. 
But mm -hmm. one thing I have just a general question, not about the AI or the Forge. I'm very fascinated by Forge in terms of kind of the, the work that they're, they're doing. Did you discuss in terms of, have, have you understood how Atlassian plans to make money on this in terms of, you know, what's the revenue stream? When I attended the developer days that they had in the US in November, uh, I remember, you know, that one of the product managers did mention that, you know what, we don't have anything right now. We want to offer it for free because that was a very big question, right? Obviously the AWS Lambda compute is, is very small, but it's still a charge. <laughs> so we have to wonder what it is. And I agree with you, Igor, when you mentioned about, I'm sure the limits and everything, they'll, they'll, they'll map out, you know, as, as they go to general lease. But I'm curious, you know, what's the strategy of behind Atlassian in terms of, of building this and, and, and what's the thinking? If, again, just general, general, just curious to hear. Yeah, I mean, from what I know, and again, I'll be careful in, you know, predictions or to not disclose anything. But again, it's more of a, I, I think it will be um, limited to some uh, execution numbers so that uh, it's not... Uh, somebody doesn't run Bitcoin mining on that or anything like it. But at the same time, uh, there would be a percentage, some cut from their app revenue. So which means for each app, you would have to give out some part of revenue you, you're making on the app for as a part of the cost, operating cost. But uh, I guess that would not, that will be flat. So it would be like limits here and then the cut, flat cut. So. So you will not have to pay for executions, at least from what I, I learned at some point. Maybe this book could change many times. But Yeah. And a friend just posted me the, uh, the date for Team 21, which will be on April 28th to April 30th. So um, I guess all will be, will be revealed in these three days. So, because general availability for Forge is now announced to to March, uh, end of Q1. So, and with general availability comes pricing, I guess. Uh, and the roadmap will probably be updated during summit. We were we were kind of guessing last week what the great reveal will be during the summit this year, and maybe pricing for Forge will be the great reveal. I don't know. So, um, how they want to earn money. And I don't know how other platforms do that. Um, maybe they will go the, after the Heroku model. That would be useful. So something like Heroku. I don't know how they charge, if they charge. But um, that would be probably be a model. But then again, uh, the pricing is a bit difficult because it's a marketplace. You're, so you are selling the app. And then Atlassian would be charging for the execution of the app. So that's uh, kind of tricky. So, or you wouldn't, you wouldn't receive a flat license fee for the app. So basically user per month or something like that. But you would be, um, it would be a bit like Spotify or, or uh, Apple Music. So every time your app does something, you get a percentage of the charge that Atlassian um, takes for the usage. So like Apple Music or Spotify, you know, every then time you they- can, hmm? Then you can buy yourself a pizza. After yeah, two million so, <laughs> exactly. So so two, two, two million CPU cycles buys one pizza or whatever. So that's, no, but that could be a model that you basically, every time they play your song, you get paid, uh, whatever. No. Uh, thank you, Igor, for the presentation and for the Q&A. That was very interesting and uh, hope to see you back in the future when it's on the marketplace and you have made your first million or something and um, can, can buy a pizza yeah can, can buy a pizza, pizza and yes. give us a kind of retrospective so how was your first year and your first million with scrum meister yeah. um, and hope to see you somewhere in the real world someday yeah. so uh, maybe at the next summit that will happen in person let's hope yeah, something like that. So everybody, thank you. Have a nice evening and uh, goodbye.